am a true believer that the reason that marijuana is illegal isn't about drugs. It isn't about marijuana. Right. It's re those are a smokescreen. You know, yeah. it's a myth that they made up. It's really about money, and power, and hemp fuel and hemp fiber primarily. And they made up the whole marijuana myth back in uh, 1911. Pancho Villa had a Mexican Revolution. They had a a song they had called La Cucaracha. And in that song, they talk about the cockroach smokes marijuana. Well, shortly after that happened, you know, they nationalized the petrochemical industry in Mexico. The robber barons in Texas and Pennsylvania who ran those industries were not happy. And they created this whole marijuana myth based on that word to play on the racist fears of that were popular, you know, until recently. And so uh, we designed this bill to completely reverse that. And we did it uh, uh, by allowing individuals to cultivate their own. And for people who want to sell herb, they would be able to get a license to sell it, get a license to process it, and get a license to grow it says in our initiative that the licenses will be equitably distributed among all applicants. So no one big grower will take advantage of the whole market. You know, uh, in the southeast they have tobacco allotments where the tobacco companies buy tobacco from farmers uh, and they're limited in the amount that they can grow. They have a certain number of acres. A farmer might have 500 acres. He'll have one acre of tobacco, 499 acres of corn or sorghum, and it's the tobacco, the acre of tobacco that makes as much or more money than all the other put together. I think that's going to be the case once we regulate the sale of marijuana. We say in our initiative that hemp will not be regulated and that uh, we, no federal license is required to grow hemp. You know, to grow hemp under the bill that passed in 2009, and that's a good bill, and Floyd Brzezanski, uh, assistant DA and state legislator had, had worked on it for more than a more than a dozen years more than uh about five sessions as far five or six sessions anyway that requires that you grow this hemp that's less than three tenths of one percent thc well that hemp is dwarf hemp and by limiting the thc they limit the output of all the products that come from it, it only produces about half as much fiber and a 15th or a 20th as much seed oil and protein. And so we mandate that the hemp that will be grown will be the hemp that produces the most fuel, fiber, and food. I believe that the high THC hemp with big flowers and big seeds is going to be the most productive. And so the whole idea that the hemp crop is going to ruin the marijuana crop is not true because the marijuana crop and the hemp crop will both be high THC hemp. It won't be the low THC hemp that uh, they force them to grow in Canada right. and force them to grow in Europe. Right. So, you know, uh, Paul, I wanted to just mention um, we're going to be discussing this right after this specifically about hemp and M80, okay. measure 80. Um, so I though I'm glad you hit on it. I don't want okay, to. I don't want to spend too much time on it, the right? Well, we got, we're trying to focus got a couple of the M80s campaign this, so. on on hip as well. I, I agree, and that, that's why we. But we wanted to break it into. I really believe bit. that the seed is what we need. We need uh, the seed, agree. and it's the seed that's going to be the most valuable product once we pass this. Another thing our initiative does is it names the, the all the seeds and starts of all varieties of cannabis won't be regulated and it will be considered hemp. That way Monsanto can't come in here and tell us our hemp is already free and it's been grown in this state for decades. So they can't come in here and patent the seed and sell it back to us. You know, the French seed is the only seed that they can grow in those those low THC countries. It's a special patented strain. And, and it's it's one of the few that's been developed down to that low THC level, yeah. am I right? They've got a new one that's down to 0.2%. They've got us all on the law now to 0.3. They've developed a new one at 0.2, but its offspring naturally have more THC than that. So you can't grow that seed. You can only cultivate it. But up in Canada, that's what they're growing for is that low THC uh, seed. That's the primary economic product they're producing for body products and food. 
and that only makes about 600 pounds of seed an acre. Study out in Notre Dame on feral hemp in southern Illinois, and central Illinois says that you uh, you'll get uh, over 8,000 pounds of seed per acre, 15 times more. But anyway, I think that's where the money is going to be in the future. It's really going to be in seed oil and seed protein, especially as a fuel, and that that fuel will be much cheaper than any other seed oil that's out there today uh, because the other seed oils it competes against in terms of price for biodiesel today would be soybean oil, canola, or rapeseed oil, and sunflower seed oil. Each of those produces about 100 to 120 gallons per acre. Where if you're getting 8,000 pounds of seed breaker, you're gonna get about 300 gallons of oil and 600 pounds of high protein hip seed meal left over. And I think that's where the money is gonna be at in the future. And the fiber will just be a byproduct of that. You know, when you make corn into ethanol to make fuel, you're taking food out of the, the supply chain. So less people have food. Where you make fuel from hip, you're putting food into the supply chain. So, uh, you know, Jim a minute ago was talking about the clear cutting. You know, we can obviously plant hemp instead. I mean, we all know, I'm sure in this group, that hemp makes much more paper, fabric, canvas, rope, lace, linen from its stems than anything else on this planet. And so uh, that'll free that up. So, we believe it'll raise about $200 million a year in revenue for the state. About $60 million of that will be savings in costs from uh, uh, locking up marijuana growers and dealers and processing possession tickets and all of that. These numbers come from uh, Harvard economist Jeffrey Myron, who did a study nationally on this and is concentrated on Oregon as well. So, um, you know, we, we designed it specifically to be upheld in the inevitable federal court challenge it'll face after passage. You know, this uh, violates federal law, obviously, uh, the Controlled Substances Act and the, uh, the treaties that the United States spearheaded, the Single Convention Treaty. The treaty actually mandates that it be a Schedule One drug. But the state of Oregon's Board of Pharmacy led the way in making a Schedule II drug. Iowa has now followed suit. So in a couple states, it's Schedule II already. But uh, as long as we can't legally grow it, then we there's no legal supply of it. So this will provide a legal supply to sell to pharmacies that will allow it and uh, sell to patients. Patients, marijuana will not be taxed. Under our initiative, it says explicitly that marijuana for patients will be sold at farmer's cost. So adult marijuana smokers will subsidize the medical patients who need it. It will also allow doctors to prescribe marijuana for anything they think that it uh, qualifies for. We won't have to go through this ridiculous process with the health authority. Weird how they changed their name from the health department to the health authority. But uh, it would allow doctors to recommend it for anything. So I think the price would come way down, availability will be up, uh, and we'll create tens of thousands of jobs and thousands of new companies and several new industries and put Oregon on the cutting edge of exciting new economic and ecological development. And uh, we'll see hemp biofuel become our primary energy source for cars and ethanol from hemp. And uh, that's the world's largest industry. And instead of the Saudi princes and the uh, corporate stockholders uh, putting it all away in their Swiss bank accounts, it'll go into our farmers' pockets where they'll spend it in our communities and just change the whole economic paradigm. And that's the goal here. So it's a transformative initiative. And uh, I'll just take questions and answer any other questions you might have about the initiative.
I love it. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I have a couple of quick questions before we go to the audience. And, um, one of the things you just mentioned was the, um, oh, the any condition clause, which I applaud you for putting in. But uh, some people have pointed out that there may be a conflict with that the OMMA is also stated in there that it's left intact. Yeah, yeah. And, and the OMMA, of course, currently has limitations on conditions. Um, so how does that how does that work itself out? Is, do they just have to switch the OMMA to They'd any condition? They'd have to switch the OMMA. Okay. And you won't need a license to grow it anymore or to possess it. So for right now, you know, use, I didn't right. want, we wanted to keep it intact in case... We, we envision that the, the federal government's going to come in here and enjoin this law before it goes into effect. And this was designed especially for that eventuality. So we wanted to keep the OMMA intact and separate. And there are actually two severability clauses at the very end of our initiative. We, I couldn't decide on which one to use, so I put both of them in there. And so uh, uh, they, they, the pieces of OMMA will still be there while this is enjoined. You know, the Death with Dignity law was passed here in Oregon back in 1994, and it allowed doctors to prescribe phenobarbital to help terminally ill patients kill themselves. So that conflicted with federal law too. The federal government came in and enjoined that law. It was fast-tracked through the federal court system. And uh, in 1996, in less than two years, the Supreme Court came back and upheld the Death with Dignity law, and it's been in effect ever since. So that was similarly about doctors prescribing phenobarbital, you know. So, so I, that actually kind of leads to the other question I had about um, conflict with the feds over having state employees who will be working for the, the OCC, Oregon, Oregon Cannabis, Cannabis Commission. Oregon Cannabis Commission. 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 Not, not oh, the Oregon Cannabis Connection. No. Um, <laughs> cool and, name. Though. Yeah, it's going to work. Yeah, that, that, that moniker will work okay for me yeah. probably. Uh, is there a problem there? Because I know that the, the feds have made threats to other states about prescribing or letting them... You know, it'll be enjoined in court. So while it's enjoined, we won't be able to start growing big fields for adult use. But hemp is definitely allowed under federal law, technically. It doesn't say anything in federal law about THC level for hemp. And uh, med medical is also allowed under federal law. So... Right. The scheduling will be the issue, and there, it, it comes down to the international treaty. The international treaties say that uh, if implementing this scheduling system violates the human rights or the civil rights of the parties uh, signing it, uh, population, then the, those parties can withdraw from those portions. So we're saying that allow, you know, not allowing us to grow the oldest crop crop that was first sown, you know, at least 12,000 years ago, and the crop that produces more fuel, fiber, food, and medicine than any other violates our human rights in a number of ways. We set out seven points in a preamble that are findings by the people. And under our system of government, the theory is that the people are sovereign. The people are the rulers, and below the rulers is a constitution. And uh, according to judicial precedent, the Constitution and international treaties have equal weight in uh, court proceedings. Below that is federal statutes and state municipal statutes are uh, below that. So we have the sovereign make these seven findings based on historical, legal, scientific, and constitutional issues. And so those findings are going to be you know, re reviewed by the Supreme Court. And if they agree, as most of us do, that the people are sovereign, they're not going to be able to overturn that. All right. All right. Thank and we you. also, like just it. for good measure, implemented the system of controls for production that's mandated in the single convention treaty. That's why we have one central commission saying that it will take control of the entire crop within four months of harvest and say the areas and plots of land that uh, are, are to be cultivated. That's language that's lifted from the single convention treaty. And so uh, the commission will hold, you know, electronic possession will be just as good as physical possession. And so if you want to have a 
like a winery or a brew pub work today where you grow your own, you process it, and you sell your product on your own land, that will be allowed. And so that was the plan. And this is to make cannabis inexpensive for everyone and to free it for fuel, fiber, and food. And like I said, I really believe the seed, fuel, and food are going to be the primary economic product that we'll be producing once we legalize marijuana. Yeah. It's a very tight piece of legislation. It's obvious you've worked on it for years, and it's, it's I appreciate all your work. Started drafting it in 1988. <laughs> Hired a good it's friend good, of mine who's stuff. passed away now, and we worked on it. It's been through 200 drafts. We've had input from over 200 experts all around the country. And we did two polls to uh, figure out what would be more likely to pass. The polls said, hey, don't put it in with liquor because uh, we'll lose a certain percentage of voters. And there's the view that the OLCC is corrupt. So we took it, re you know, one of the things we changed between 2008 and 2010 was setting up uh, a cannabis commission that's exclusively cannabis and saying that, you know, the markets won't be merged. Kind of like what happens unless they outlaw it in the Netherlands, uh, where the markets for hard drugs and marijuana are kept separate because they allow the sales to adults. So let's open it up to anybody who's got questions. Yeah, right there. Hey, Paul, can you talk about exportation of marijuana and, and the uh, byproducts to other states or other countries in this measure? So the exportation of, of marijuana and byproducts to other states or countries under how it's covered under OCTA? Yeah, we say that uh, the price will be set to discourage illegal import and export. So at first, the price will be higher because we don't want it to be illegally shipped to Idaho or Nevada or any place else where it can't be legally shipped. But it says that the OCC, the Oregon Cannabis Commission, will promote its sale in all legal, national, and international markets. So as the other states start to regulate it, say I-502 passes up in Washington. When we produce it, we'll be able to ship it to them because they would be a legal market and they'd be selling it. So uh, the same would be true for any other legitimate market. As freedom spreads and people are able to buy it legally in all the states, because I really believe if, if we pass this here in Oregon, it will change the law. But if it passes in Colorado and Washington too, it's going to be a major transformation. We're going to see, it'll be akin to the toppling of the Berlin Wall. Or uh, yeah, the top yeah. of the Lennon statue in Red Square. You know, freedom will ring around the world. There'll be those people, you know, there are over a thousand people in the American jails for 20 years or more, a hundred or so for life without the possibility of parole. Right here in the United States, they never owned a gun, they never threatened another person, they didn't steal anything, they just grew a plant, and they're in prison for life without the possibility of parole. If I was charged, for growing marijuana, which I do with a license. If I had to go through the federal courts, technically, I could face life without the possibility of parole because I have priors for growing marijuana. So uh, this will change that. Just think of those poor people in Malaysia where they're hung for 200 grams or more. Man, if these things pass, this is just gonna be a ray of sunshine into our culture's life all over this world. And so that's what we're, we're trying to do. Right now we have a pole out in the field it's a small poll. We tried to fund a big poll. We weren't able to do it. So we've gone ahead with a small poll. And uh, we have a, a really catchy visual ad campaign that should come out sometime in the next week or two. We're going to be cutting more ads with Willie Nelson. You know, Willie Nelson did an ad for us in March that was a big help. He's going to cut another ad for us here just before our Hempstock Festival. That's huge. That's and great. he uh, uh, is going to be one of the faces is he has a five acres of land here in Oregon he started his songwriting career as a DJ in Portland for those of you who don't know that Willie Nelson in the early 60s was a disc jockey on a country music station in Portland and he started his songwriting career and first wrote his first hits for Patsy Cline that song crazy while he was a DJ in Portland so his and he owns a big chunk of uh, sequential Pacific biodiesel which is the largest biodiesel producer in the United States. And uh, he's one of the main spokespeople for the National Biodiesel Alliance. He's opened a number of hemp 
at biodiesel, not hip, but biodiesel stores. They went there, they were Willie's truck stop. Sequential work with them. They were in California, Texas. They've gone out of business now. But uh, he's a big proponent of biodiesel. In fact, I first found out about biodiesel in October of 1990 when I went back to Lexington, Kentucky, in Gatewood Gobray. Took a few gallons of biodiesel and poured it into his engine and drove from Lexington through the state capitol in Frankfurt and on to Louisville, where Willie did a concert for Gatewood. So, uh, there's a little aside. Right. Any, any other questions? Thank Justin? You. Oh, I was curious. Uh, there was an interesting, very flattering article a few weeks ago in uh, Portland Paper that was uh, brought up the issues with the education provisions that are in your bill. Did those scare you to put in? Did you... No, you know, they, they misrepresented it entirely. Oh, they, took, uh, they took points from the preamble we at, at one of the seven preambles listed some findings by three state supreme courts and the Schaefer Commission. What the fuck are you talking about, man? And so, three Sorry state supreme that, courts: uh, the state of uh, Alaska in Raven versus State, the state of Michigan in the People of Michigan uh, versus uh, John Sinclair. And the state of Hawaii in a case with Paul Cantor, the guitarist for the Jefferson Airplane and Starship. Uh, we based the, this, these set of findings on these common issues in these three state Supreme Court rulings and in the, the Schaefer Commission that was commissioned by uh, President Nixon back in the 70s. And so they took these things in the preamble and said that we're going to force the kids to learn this. Well, if you look at the actual language of the educational portion, uh, it says that children will learn about the scientifically accurate information about drugs and psychoactive substances. It doesn't say anything about marijuana. And that uh, uh, they'll be taught accurate information and how to uh, the use of substances can harm their development and discourage the use of those substances. But if, if as adults, they decide to use psychoactive substances, that they still have to responsibly fulfill all the duties that they owe to other citizens under our social compact, such as, you know, not hitting each other with a car, not beating each other up or stealing from each other. Basically, it just teaches civics. You know, good old-fashioned civics. It doesn't get taught much anymore. Yeah, I, I read that piece, and I thought it was kind of ridiculous. So that, that editorial yeah. it, it, it was, was propaganda. Was, that, was, that gave us an insight to how they're going to You know, getting on you about Genesis. and yeah. getting Well, they on, are. Yeah, it was ridiculous. They are. There was another editorial in uh, the Portland Tribune a couple days ago where the sheriffs and the prosecutors and the police have uh, basically said, you know, we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket. Mexican cartels are going to move in here and take over the state, and uh, we're all, it's going to be Al Capone again. Well, it's just the opposite of what the actual truth is, but you know, uh, if we have, they want to fight the argument, you know, using those kind of lies, it's just, a, you know, the question is how well can we get out our message about him, about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the founders depending on him and, and uh, promoting him, George Washington wrote to Alexander Hamilton and said, how can we promote him, you know, as Secretary of the Treasury? And would it be proper to, to have a policy encouraging the cultivation of him? Well, that's what our initiative will do, is encourage the cultivation of him and finance it and promote it. Thank and you. so it's really a transformative bill. Any, any other questions uh, for Paul? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'm a disabled vet myself. Okay. Washington State? Yeah. Well, the thing is, this guy in Virginia, who's also a veteran, Michael Kravitz, worked to get a policy through the VA. And so now the VA allows you to use medical marijuana as a patient there and still be on their paying contracts and still get their other health care and not use that against you as long as you're following your state law. Right, mine, mine basically covers a different department of government. 
Ah. Is it champs or something like that? Well, no, it's uh, it'd be the Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And VA doesn't. VA right. Well, you know, we don't specifically <laughs> mandate that the government change that for uh, at a federal level. We're not in a position to, to make federal law through the state industry <laughs> process. But I think that the Supreme Court will enjoin it, a lot of parts of this law. Parts of it will go into effect, parts of it won't. And uh, that uh, we built a proposal that can be upheld in the inevitable federal court challenge it'll face after passage. Yeah, it's go funny. Ahead, we got to put our, our faith in the uh, Supreme Court yeah, to I make this I don't decision have any. and not our legislators or ourselves right. again. Right. But, oh well, that's the way that the legal system works. I have no confidence in the Supreme Court of John Roberts at all, but we'll see what happens. Go ahead, Tony. Hey, Paul, how do you, how do you foresee the issues that represent Reciprocity. I drive from Santa Fe to Phoenix to San Diego, back yeah. to Las Vegas, up Good into question. Portland, Washington. Um, you know, initially, of course, we can't address that. There is reciprocity for medical marijuana card holders in five states and the District of Columbia, quite ironically. If you have a medical marijuana permit, you're covered in the three M states, I like to call them. Michigan, Maine, Montana, also Arizona and Rhode Island, and the District of Columbia. So you just carry your permit when you're in those states and you're legal there. The folks at the Portland airport let me fly out with marijuana and my volcano all the time. You know, they'll let you fly out with a pound and a half without any problem. I even had one uh, TSA guy tell me his dad had a volcano and loved it. <laughs> and that, uh, but does, uh, that, does that depend on where you're flying to? No, because you don't get checked when you fly to. They only check it when you fly, where you fly from. So when you land, there's nobody there to search you. And it, it was, but if you're leaving Portland and you're flying to New York City, yeah, is you're the not Portland going to be legal TSA. in New York City. And I've done that. I've flown from Portland to New York City. I always carry pot wherever yeah. I go, you know. And so I, uh, I'm just discreet, and I haven't had a problem with uh, carrying it. I try not to bring much back when I fly out. I might just bring a little tiny bit and try to give most of it away where I go, you know. And then it's smart enough to figure out in Portland that you're landing in New York and you shouldn't have that. They just see that you got a card and say, go ahead. Yeah, they don't determine where you're right. going to yeah. right there. I, I when, before, when the law first went into effect, I had a uh, TSA guy tell me, well, where are you flying to? So I'm flying to Hawaii. I have a Hawaii card too, <laughs> clinics in Hawaii too. And so uh, he said, you're not going to be legal when you land there. I said, well, here's my Hawaii card. Well, you're not going to be legal when you're flying between here and there. It's over the open ocean, and you're not going to be able to arrest anyone. So he finally let me go, but that was about, you know, 10 years ago or so. But since then, That's TSA... That's 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah That's pretty good. Paving yeah. it. Yeah. I've been carrying my volcano on every flight for a long, long time. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Waves? Uh, uh, can you walk us through the permission procedures a little bit? How it avoids being a bottleneck? Sure. Um, the initiative says that the commission will be appointed by the governor. The first seven people will be appointed by the governor no later than uh, New Year's Eve. So we'll have them nominate seven people. Then it says that the commission will start accepting license applications by February 28th. So we can try to get a crop in the ground this year, next year. And so... Uh, uh, you'll simply apply. Uh, you know, the, the commission will create new rules through the administrative rule process. It'll be fast-tracked. You know, if we pass it, I expect I'll be one of the commissioners. And so uh, I'll be trying to maintain the integrity of the, the law, and there'll be six other people on the commission. I'm not sure who all they'll be. The governor will appoint them this first time around. There's been some concern about the composition of the commission. One of the last things I changed in the, the initiative was the composition of the commission. Initially, I was just going to have the governor appoint them all. And now that's actually had some blowback because uh, uh, that's been one of the most contentious issues when you look at it. Uh, we, 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 I changed it at the last minute before filing it to have five members that are selected in an election by growers and processors. So growers and processors will elect five members of the commission, and then two will be uh, named by the governor. 
That sounds and nice. It's very similar to all agricultural commissions in the state. There's an agricultural commission law that says 70% of the agricultural commission has to be people in the industry, the affected industry. But the media has picked up on that and said we're going to have the growers and processors running it all and once again we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket. Right, I'm saying are you getting kicked back from even people in the industry, patients, specifically patient-centered organizations that are saying, well, why aren't patients on this panel? Is that part of it as well? Or is but it they just want to be they, on it. They well, just first it'll be named by the government. The, the medical thing, you know, uh, it's not a medical only initiative. It's for complete full transformation of this. And it'll change the whole dynamic. When right. when patients don't have to pay for a license and don't have an artificial limit on the amount they can grow and a doctor can recommend it for anything, uh, the OMM, I don't know many people after that that'll be, you know, getting an OMMP card. You know, uh, right. why do you need it if you can grow your own without a license? Why limit yourself to, you know, the, the, the 12, 6 standard, the 18 plants and pound and a half when there's no limit on the amount you can grow? In fact, our initiative says the seeds and starts of all strains of cannabis will be considered hemp. So the horticulture market for cannabis will be wide open. You'll be able to go to any horticulture place, any garden store, Fred Meyer even, and buy your marijuana plants right there. Legally, that would technically be legal. It'd be up to those businesses to decide what they want to they, uh, sell. But even this the bees like it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, but does it, uh, I was going to say, is it... Um, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Wendy. So what's the anticipated turnaround from the time somebody applies? Well, what's the question? Well, already. I think 30 days or less. Yeah, so what's the anticipated you know, we don't, turnaround we don't, for a We say that the commission will set the rules and regulations necessary to carry out its duties. But if I'm there and have anything to do with it, it's going to be 30 days or less. Yeah. You know, there's no reason yeah. it should take longer than 30 days. You know, it's kind of like a driver's license. It doesn't take a month to get a driver's license. I don't know why the OMMA takes six months or anything. As long as you have not violated this new law, the old laws won't have any impact. If you're like me and you're a marijuana felon, that won't stop you at all. You'll be able to get a license. It only will be if you violate this new law, then your access to the licenses will be restricted. But I think we don't set up the actual way waves we we say that it'll be set up by the commission you know it's already long enough really you know it's a... <laughs> so just to clarify for this coming year anybody current check out the program should stay in the program for another yeah. year because they need that overlap that's right i believe that patients if they they want to remain protected and it might not not just be a year it might be a little bit longer than a year if you want to wait till you have a, a legal uh store to go buy it from uh, you know, if it's enjoined in the courts, I think the dispensaries that are just serving patients will be legal because that doesn't conflict with the international treaties at all. Also, the horticultural use does not conflict. The, the international treaties say that cannabis can still be cultivated for horticulture and for a hemp fuel fiber and food and medicine and that the, the parties don't have to prohibit this. So that will immediately free it for all of those uses and that won't be regulated. It'll only be if you want to get a license and sell it for non-medical purposes. Then uh, that would be the, the reason you'd have to, to get one of these new OCC licenses, Oregon Cannabis Commission license. All right, you want to take one more question? Sure. Are uh, more? more? Okay, good. Um, any, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm kind of confused about the whole international treaty and what they were telling us we have to do and what like, we're trying to abide by. And, like, well. There's this guy who really came up and, and spearheaded marijuana prohibition. He's uh, Harry Anslinger. His wife was the niece of uh, Andrew Mellon, who uh, was a big wig in, uh, in steel and in oil and uh, all of those, all of those. And so uh, the, the petrochemical industry. And so uh, he spearheaded it, and he came up after getting marijuana illegal in the 30s. He came up with uh, this treaty idea that he spearheaded, and it's a single convention treaty that mandates that marijuana be a Schedule One drug. So uh, that treaty's in place, and we tried to write our initiative to be in as close compliance with it as possible. In Section One of our initiative, it says this is a scientific act 
by the people of the state of Oregon to lower the misuse and abuse of cannabis and stop the diversion to minors, you know. And so that sentence is in there specifically to, to add more compliance to the single convention treaty. But I, it's something that I, I look forward to the day it's removed. It's crazy. They'll take the oldest agricultural crop, the first crop purposely grown by humans, the plant that makes more fuel, more fiber, more food, more medicine, than any other plant, and they're going to make that one illegal. Right. It's all about the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, fascist, sons of a bitches. You know, Careful, like, you sound like Michael Moore. <laughs> Actually, that's a quote from a good old friend of mine who passed away uh, in January, Gatewood Galbraith. He introduced me to Willie Nelson. He's the guy who drove around Kentucky, I was talking about, in a hip-powered car back in October of 1990. He had another really good line. And, uh, you know, my father was a, on a PT boat in World War II, and he fought the fascists and to stop the Japanese. And other friends of ours, like Dr. Philip Levesque, he crossed the Rhine under fire uh, from the Nazis, and two-thirds of his platoon were killed as they were crossing the Rhine. And he arrested 26 soldiers, officers, Nazi officers at once. And so they didn't fight the fascists, so we would be, have to pee in a jar for a job. And that's another one of those Gateway Galbraith lines I'm pleased to carry on with. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the quick question I had, so they, they, you said earlier that, that they're allowing the treaty to allow hemp for growing. Is that just for Europe? And I mean, how is this treaty like set up for the hemp? It says hemp, hemp is not regulated under this treaty. It says it's free for hemp and for medicine and for uh, uh, horticultural purposes. So that part can be implemented immediately and isn't in conflict with those treaties. Right now there's no legal source. So yeah, if there was a legal source of cannabis, technically here in Oregon under Schedule 2 it could be sold through pharmacies. Go ahead, Brandon. Uh, would you say that if the ACTA passed, that this would be like the first true legalization law passed in like the last 41 years? Oh yeah, the last uh, may ever really, because uh, you know marijuana was wild and free uh, until uh, uh, the mar first marijuana laws went into place. You know, and that was back. Uh, I guess the first one was 1914 in San Antonio. Oh uh, no, El Paso, in El Paso, Texas. And then uh, you know the federal See, government passed it, in. and it was the states passing it, making yeah. the federal government f followed suit. So this just yeah. goes to show you we can turn it around in the same way. Yeah, alcohol uh, prohibition yeah. was overturned the same way. You know, Oregon passed uh, an initiative to remove all the penalties and legalize the sale of alcohol in 1932, but the feds didn't do it until 33. The state of New York passed it and said took all the laws off alcohol sale and production in. 1927. So uh, this is. Uh, no, I wonder The states will lead. The feds will follow. Uh, yeah. Uh, somebody knows we got two other initiatives in two other states in Washington, Colorado. They tried in Ohio and a couple of other places. Michigan. You know. Missouri. Didn't quite happen, but but we've got legalization initiatives for the people to vote on in three states, and I'm sure you support all of them because it's I just going to make it an yeah. even larger mandate, right? On That's the exactly feds. right. I support all. There, you know, I just came for the Seattle Hip Fest last week, and there are a lot of people talking bad about I-502 there because of certain provisions in it. You know, if you're one of those guys locked up in prison for life without the possibility of parole, or one of those poor souls in Malaysia about to be hung for possessing 200 grams or more marijuana, and you hear it failed because somebody didn't like the fact they'd make a little bit less money on it, that's that's evil in my book. You know, we want to free it. So I support all of them and unequivocally. You know, uh, I didn't like all the provisions in Prop 19 in California, but I supported that. And uh, uh, I'm not going to quibble with the folks in Washington. If they make it legal for an adult to possess an ounce, they make it legal for an adult to buy an ounce. That's a step forward in my book. Some might ask, why are you doing this? As you said earlier, uh, the OMMA may go away and you have these clinics and you, so much yeah, so you're shooting clinics. yourself That's in the how, foot, right? Well, in a way I am, but I am also a big believer that uh, you got to embrace change. If you think you're going to do the same thing you're doing today, 
next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, at some point you're going to be really sadly disappointed because it's the world's changing and it's going to change faster and faster in the near future. I really believe that marijuana is a bellwether issue for the future of freedom and that it's really about freedom of thought and freedom of consciousness. And right now, freedom is under attack. You know, they say corporations have more rights than human beings in this Citizens United ruling. Well, you know, in the near future, we're going to see an exponential growth in biological technology, genetics and genomic science, an exponential growth in convergence with nanotechnology, miniaturization of machines and processes, and an exponential growth in uh, artificial intelligence. And that those will all merge together and if we don't establish a natural individual's right to think the thoughts we want to think, to experience the consciousness we want to experience, the dystopian possibilities in the future are grim. I mean, things like uh, the Terminator, the Matrix, those all come into the realm of reality. We have to expand natural individual rights. And yeah. marijuana is a bellwether and a start of that, but we have to have a right to privacy we have to make sure that natural individuals have more rights than artificial ones like corporations and in the future artificial intelligence Liberty. it really is about freedom and the future of freedom and i think marijuana is a bellwether issue that is uh few people see you know they've used marijuana laws against the activists in the 50s and 60s they were working for to stop the wars and uh, it's really about uh, freedom.